conductive pathologies in hearing loss. So a conductive pathology occurs in the outer or middle ear, and that's the conductive portion where sound gets transmitted through to the cochlea. So it could affect a child's general health. Medical treatment often restores hearing. This is not necessarily permanent, especially not in the case of ear infections, but there is a potential impact on language acquisition and educational performance, so it's important to address these. Some common um, conductive hearing losses, which we'll talk about, but mostly I'm going to focus on otitis media, and that is an infection of the middle ear space. There's also could be collapsed ear canals, abnormalities of the middle ear ossicles, atresia, which is um, no pinna, stenosis and narrow ear canals, cerumen, wax, swimmer's ear, an infection in the skin of the outer ear, a perforated tympanic membrane, an object in the ear canal, cholesteatoma, or mastitis. So we have otitis media without any other conditions or otitis media with a sensory neural hearing loss, which would make um, pretty severe because in addition to the sensory neural hearing loss, you have trouble with the conductive system. And otitis media is an inflammation of the middle ear space. And sometimes there is fusion or fluid that goes along with it. So the fluid can occur with or without the presence of an active infection. So I'm sure you've heard um, there's fluid in the ear. The fluid might be fluid or might be infected fluid. If it's infected fluid, the child will have a fever, the infant will be crying, the infant will be uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, you can see the difference. But the fluid that isn't infected is sort of like a silent problem because you don't know that the child has it in its ear and you don't know that the child isn't getting a clear message to the brain. There's subacute otitis media, anywhere from three weeks to three months. Chronic otitis media is fluid for more than three months in the ear. In the ear. Approximately half of all episodes of otitis media are silent, and they go undetected because the child doesn't appear sick because the fluid's not infected. So you have this non-infected fluid gathering in the middle ear, and um, you hope that the pediatrician does a check for it. Remember, the middle ear is supposed to be filled with air. When it's filled with fluid, that's going to impact the transmission of the sound from air to the fluid of the cochlea. We need the middle ear space to amplify sound as it goes from air to the fluid of the cochlea. So if it's filled with fluid, it can't properly do its job amplifying the sound to send it to the cochlea. With the first bout, there's a likelihood of recurrent and severe episodes increase. They're caused by malfunctioning eustachian tubes. So a viral infection in like a cold or an upper respiratory infection gets blown into the middle ear space. Therefore, ear infections are more prevalent in the winter when the child's more likely to get a cold. And if you see this picture, we have an adult eustachian tube and an infant eustachian tube. So the infant eustachian tube is on a more horizontal plane and the adult is on a more vertical plane. So infants have those really cute round faces, but they're more likely to take a cold and blow it into their middle ear space than an adult with a longer, more narrow face. So remember, the eustachian tube is a tiny structure that connects the back of the throat to the middle ear. It's combined of cartilage and muscles. It has three main functions to equalize the air pressure between the outer ear and the middle ear, to protect the delicate middle ear from the nose and throat secretions, and to drain normal secretions from the middle ear cavity down to the throat. And that's why you see in your nose and throat touch because it's all connected. The ear is connected to the nose, through the eustachian tube and the throat. So the most important function of the eustachian tube is to keep the pressure in the middle ear the same as the pressure in the ear canal. When both pressures are the same at atmospheric pressure, the tympanic membrane can move at its best. 
when the pressures are mismatched, your ears feel full, you don't hear so well, and you feel like you want to pop your ears. You don't pop your ears. You're just going to try to open your eustachian tube to aerate out the middle ear space. The average hearing loss caused by an ear infection is 25 decibels, and it can increase up to 50 decibels. And remember, we said we want our children to be hearing at like 15 dB or better because they're learning language. So it's so important that they have good hearing. So you might say 25, not so bad. But remember, 25 dB, it's a log scale. And these are kids that are learning language, so it is bad. Um, the fluid could persist for two to three weeks. So you have this like mild to moderate hearing loss that could last for an extended period of time. The peak prevalence of otitis media is between 6 and 18 months, and then it occurs again when a child enters school. It's um, more common in children with learning disabilities than children without learning disabilities. Other causes include congenital abnormalities, so children with cleft palate are more likely to get it. Children with Down syndrome has to do with the structure of their face. And those who are more prone to upper respiratory tract infections are also more likely to get it. Environmental factors include attendance at daycare centers, opposive to, um, exposure to passive smoking. Do you guys remember that public service announcement New York City put out um, to get people to stop smoking? In one of them, there was this baby crying and crying in pain, sitting on the floor as it's there was you know it was sitting in um, secondhand smoke so the baby was had an ear infection and it was caused by the secondhand smoke children in the NICU are also more likely to get ear infections uh, children that experience ear infections in their first year of life may have difficulty learning individual phonemes and sounds because they've got this mild hearing loss that's still serious it's often diagnosed with pneumatic otoscopy. Um, other behavioral symptoms, if it's infected, irritability, listlessness, distractibility, pulling at the ear, head banging, rolling from side to side. I remember when I was little, I had an ear infection. I don't know how I remember this, but I do remember pulling on my ear because it hurt so much. Um, the most common cause is streptococcus. The recommended treatment is sometimes no treatment, so... You know, doctors these days are more reluctant to prescribe um, antibiotics. They're going with the child to see if it will resolve on its own. But if that doesn't work, amoxicillin is prescribed. There is PE tubes are given for children that have chronic cases of ear infections. So what a PE, a PE tube is, it's a pressure equalizing tube. A tube is inserted through the tympanic membrane, and it acts as an artificial eustachian tube. So fluid gets drained out through the ear canal instead of down the eustachian tube, which isn't working correctly. And they're temporary. They stay in for a few weeks to a few months, and then they fall out on their own. But they do require like a very tiny procedure. So it's safe. General anesthesia. So they fall out after 6 to 18 months on their own. And if you were to look through, take an otoscope and look through a child's ear, you could see it. It's put, you know, it's placed in an area that's not going to cause any permanent damage to the tympanic membrane or the child's hearing. So this is recommended for children that have chronic otitis media or recurrent otitis media. So when you're checking someone with hearing loss, I mean with otitis media, you want to evaluate their hearing sensitivity, their auditory behaviors, and make sure that the sound is getting to the brain. Negative repercussions of hearing loss include um, irregular medical management, low socioeconomic level, large family size, multiple languages, general malaise caused by the disease, and re re reduced linguistic inventories. It's still debatable. Research still, you know, it's a bit controversial over whether or not 
having a lot of hearing ear infections um, has a long-term effect. I think it does. Um, kids can catch up, you know, if they have good speech and language therapy and good dedicated parents, but to go for a period of three to six months with a mild to moderate fluctuating hearing loss, that's certainly going to affect a child's language development. So it's important to do speech.